Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another edition of the GSMC Fantasy Sports Podcast, brought to you, as always, by the GSMC Sports Network. My name is Christopher Shepard. Thank you, guys, yet again, for tuning in to today's show. We should have a good slate ahead of segments for you. We're going to be continuing both our prop bets kind of segments and also our college football player profile kind of segments. And this is going to be a very interesting mix. We have a mix of breakout stars, either from last year or from years before, journeymen, established veterans, and then we have two more AFC East teams to round out that division as we finished off yesterday with two other AFC East teams. So that will give you a hint of what's ahead. But before we get into any of that, I do want to remind you to like, follow, and subscribe to the show. Also, we do receive a ton of tips and donations, so if you do feel so inclined, please consider leaving them at the link gsmc.cloud. You can also leave any questions, comments, or concerns for the show there as well, but we also now are monetized, so since this is a pre-recorded show, you can leave kind of super thanks in the comments below, and I will address those as well in the next episode. So if you have anything that you like about the show and want to comment on, you can leave them in the super thanks chat in YouTube. Without further ado, let's jump right into our first segment of today's show and let's start off with a college football player profile of someone who I think is going to have another fantastic season. True freshman last year at Arizona, a program that hasn't had a history of good, consistent success. But as soon as this young man came in, Arizona looked like a team that could contend potentially for a CFP spot this year. They are in the new look Big 12, so it's going to be very difficult for them to really kind of force themselves into the conversation in that conference as it's beginning to get more crowded. But I do believe that this young man is well equipped to carry this team to high heights while there. They also have a new coach, but again, I think this young man is still well equipped, and that young man is Mr. Noah Fafita. When we think of young quarterbacks in college football, and we think about the pressure cooker environment they're stepping into, we often forget that sometimes it's necessity to try and put someone younger in to kind of keep up with the pace of college football. That's what happened with Arizona last year. Jaden Delora did not necessarily work out. A lot of injury problems, so Noah Fafita truly had to step in and he shine in that spot. And I think that kind of unexpected factor really led him to kind of go under people's radars before transcending into the national spotlight. And right now, this season, he could be my dark horse Heisman contender. Someone that you should look out for in Heisman betting odds should you want a dark horse. And so, Noah Fafita, this year, it's kind of a different story, but it's kind of the same script. You not as, don't not necessarily flip everything in the script. Because, well, you still have your wide receiver core, a guy who you really like in Titiro McMillan, 1,000-yard receiver. But you are in a new conference, and you do have a new head coach. Gone is Jed Fish. In comes Brent Brennan, a good coach out of San Jose State University. Really kind of made that program his own, had some good seasons there. But it's going to be a test of the endurance of this team. Can Noah Fafita not only perform, but somehow manage to get enough wins so that A, Arizona is not a disappointment, and B, they're still in the national spotlight. And so that's going to be the big challenge for Noah Fafita. The small challenge is he's already exceeding. I think he's already settled into college football. He now knows what it takes to compete. And so that I'm not concerned about. It's the bigger picture right now because you're not in the Pac-12 anymore where... You know, it is kind of top-heavy, but on any given Saturday, a team can come out of nowhere and really shock you. It's not as even. It's still even, but in terms of one-score games, that's where the football gods have to play their part as well. And so, while I like Noah Fafita and his profile in the Big 12, I do believe that he will have some stumbling blocks should some contests not go their way early. But let's talk about some of his stats, shall we? Because they were impressive for a true freshman. 2,869 yards and 25 touchdowns and 6 interceptions. Consider this, he didn't start right away. I believe he only started about 9 or 10 games 
in the entire season. And so, to get almost 3,000 yards as a true freshman, not playing the whole season, is truly miraculous. His best game also was against USC, a very big game. 32.3 fantasy points, 25 for 33 passing, 303 yards, 5 touchdowns, 1 INT. And since he doesn't necessarily qualify for as many games as, say, SEC quarterbacks because of the fact he played less, his worst start, fantasy start, as a college football quarterback came against Oklahoma. 17.4 points, 24 for 38, 354 yards passing, 2 touchdowns and 1 INT. And now, in the Big 12, I think that performance definitely matters, but it doesn't matter as much when there's so much parity in this league. I think that a lot of people are starting to parse out who might be the best in the Big 12. You've got your Kansas States. You've got your Utahs now, also making the move from the Pac-12 to Big 12. You've got now your Oklahoma States. These are teams that I believe are better suited for Big 12 play. I have to see if Cam Rising is healthy to really consider Utah that highly. But those three teams are perhaps the top three. Outside of that, it's just a bunch of mid-tier teams just looking to knock off those three. And... Out of all those teams, I believe that Arizona is the scariest because, A, Noah Fafita is still very young, and B, he has a lot of his core left. And if Brent Brennan can truly make that core happy, I believe that Noah Fafita will be well-equipped to handle certain challenges. I don't have their schedule in front of me, but... I do believe it's more manageable than most of those mid-tier teams. And I think that Arizona, when all is said and done, could be that fourth team that's in the discussion, kind of sneaking up on everybody. That being said, the caveat here is that in the Big 12, because of so much parity, it becomes paramount that you don't lose attention span in close games. And... In the Pac-12, Noah Fafita was in a lot of shootouts where he was on the wrong end, mainly because Arizona wasn't his talent, but also because the Kyler got dragged into that mindset. Arizona doesn't necessarily have to always swing for the fences in terms of getting ahead. The Big 12 is always just about sticking with your opponent and when the guard drops, you take advantage. We saw it last year. There were a lot of one-score games. In fact, Texas, my team, was very lucky in terms of one-score games. They really let their guard drop throughout games, but at the end, they were able to pull through because of luck. If Arizona can get lucky, and I'm not saying they will very often, but I do believe that at the end of the day, they're a team in the Big 12 that might sneak up on everybody. They could play potential spoiler. They could potentially even win the whole thing. I'm not sure. But I do believe that Arizona should be considered. Let's get back to Noah Fafita, what makes him so special. When we talk about a guy like, for example, Jalen Milrow, who's in a similar situation to Noah Fafita, fact that he's a sophomore, new head coach, we get a lot more excited about him because of the profile he's in. Alabama has been in the national radar for many years because of the Nick Saban era. Arizona only came into the national eye last year because of Noah Fafita. So, Noah Fafita I feel like should take advantage of Arizona still being a little bit disregarded to really cement his place in the Big 12 as one of the elite QBs in it. In terms of fantasy, I'm not necessarily worried about him. As long as he has McMillan with him, he and McMillan are probably the best QB wide receiver duo 
that you may never have heard of before if you haven't followed the Pac-12. But I will say this. When we think about young quarterbacks now coming in, Nico Yamileva at Tennessee, Garrett Nussmeyer at LSU, Miller Moss at USC, they all have one thing in common. They've only played in either one game or in small sample sizes. Even we could take Alex Orgy up at Michigan. Noah Fafita is the only one of them outside of Jalen Milrow to have gotten that experience last year and is now in a transition to a new conference where I feel like a lot of his best traits will come to the forefront. And if you're sitting there in your fantasy college draft and you're weighing these two options, let's say your top option's gone, maybe even your second option's gone, and these two guys are the best available, let's say, Noah Fafita and Jalen Milrow, what's to stop you from grabbing Noah Fafita? I think he's going to be in a lot more close games. He's well-equipped for shootouts because of the Pac-12's nature last year. And I just feel like the fact that Arizona hasn't been as good as Alabama for as long as Alabama, expectations aren't going to be as high. Notice how I did say that those three teams are probably going to be the best bet. I'm not including Arizona. I'm just saying that they could be right there. But at the end of the day, they haven't earned anything yet. And Noah Fafita should take that opportunity and say, I'm going to earn it by my play in a new look conference. And that being said, when you're weighing these quarterbacks and these younger guys, it's better to take the more unknown than someone whose expectations are sky high, in my humble opinion. Because Noah Fafita has proved that he can hang tough. That will just about do it for this segment. Coming up next, we'll be transitioning from prayer profiles to prop bets. We are going to finish up the AFC East, starting off with the Miami Dolphins right after the break. I feel like I'm losing my mind. Is everybody in the world blind? Please, Lord, give me a sign, a sign. I feel like I'm losing my mind. Is everybody in the world blind? Please, Lord, give me a sign, a sign. I wanna be the greatest. Everybody on the face shit. I look around and feel like everybody is the fakest. I make this every day and I'm impatient. Hoping one day I blow up from the basement. Statement, the top is so vacant. I don't need shit that I think is amazing. Waiting for my day when I'm playing. Sold out shows for a thousand faces. Hey, give me that crown. Get in my way and to be put down. It ain't your place, all this my town. If I want that shit, then I'll get it right now. I'm losing it. The noose, it fits. I'm losing shit. A stupid myth. You choose to live or choose to dip. You choose to fight or lose your grip and lose a gift. Oh. I feel like I'm losing my mind Is everybody in the world blind? Please, Lord, give me a sign A sign I feel like I'm losing my Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the GSMC Fantasy Sports Podcast, brought to you, as always, by the GSMC Sports Network. Hope you guys enjoyed that first segment. Before we switch into our second segment, I do want to remind you guys yet again that if you do feel so inclined, please consider leaving a link at the description, gsmc.cloud. Any questions, comments, or concerns can go there as well, and they will be answered and addressed at the beginning of the next episode. We also now have the ability to super chat and super thanks with you guys so if you leave in the comments and this is a pre-recorded show any super thanks i will address them as well at the beginning of the next episode without further ado let's jump right into our first prop bets deep dive of the day we're going to finish out the afc east we had some afc east segments in terms of prop bets yesterday and now we are finishing up with the last two teams we're going to start off with the better of those two 
the much better of those two, should I say, in the Miami Dolphins, a team that's actually really expecting to perhaps win the AFC East this year. They certainly have the pieces tied down. They tied down Tua. They tied down Tyreek. And now they look better than ever. they got to hope that their defense, especially those linebackers, stay healthy in Bradley Chubb and Jalen Phillips. But overall, this is a team that definitely can compete to win the AFC East and maybe make a deep run in the postseason if they don't play in any cold conditions, if you know what I mean. Now, when I think about what I love about the Miami Dolphins is that a lot of their offensive mindset stems from the genius of Mike McDaniel. Mike McDaniel could have just put all that speed on a field and just said, hey, all these guys are going to go deep. We're going to trust them beating people and to what your job means. But no, he understands the nuances so well of how to utilize speed and when and also how to get the best out of Tua at the QB position now. I think that now is the time for the Dolphins to have their offensive scheme fully realized as something that can be a force to be reckoned with. The Chiefs started doing it a little bit when Tariq Hill was still with them. And now I feel that the Miami Dolphins want to infuse this kind of speedy mindset infused with nuanced play calls to really try and dominate the AFC. They still are a little ways away. There are still some teams that I would consider ahead of them. Maybe even two teams in their division now in the Bills and the Jets. But at the end of the day, the Miami Dolphins are still going to be in the conversation in the AFC. Let's start off with their over-unders in terms of wins. They're at nine and a half wins. Pretty appropriate for this team, I would say. Um, and I think that it all comes down to whether or not this offense stays healthy. Last year was the defense that really gave them troubles when Jalen Phillips went down and Bradley Chubb went down, even Jalen Ramsey missing most of the season with injury. But at the end of the day, the offense is what really makes this thing tick here. I think the offense has the bar for the defense, if that makes any sense. When we saw it in the 70-point uh, beatdown of the Denver Broncos, I really think a lot of their game plan was just predicated and to be honest, the Denver Broncos defense was terrible at that time, but still, it was predicated on beautiful play calling, the incorporation of the speed they have. It's one thing to have that speed, like I said. It's another thing to have the knowledge to utilize it well. And so, I think this total can easily be met. The Dolphins do have a tougher slate than people think. I think the NFC West is definitely a tough NFC conference to play, or division, rather. But, at the end of the day, playing six games with the AFC East is much better than playing six games against, say, the AFC West, where you have to play the Chiefs and the Chargers and Raiders are very gritty physical teams and I drag you into their game plan. So the Dolphins have it a little bit easy because they know who their opponents are. And they know that in order to really make a statement, they have to beat both the Bills and perhaps the Jets now. So at the end of the day, I'm taking the over here, but there's a little bit of a caveat. I think this year the defense will actually stay healthy. I think that Bradley Chubb, Jalen Phillips, Jalen Rams will also have the field and will be one of the more vaunted defenses in the league. And the questions are always going to be about the offense as well. If Tua stays on schedule and proves to still be accurate, if Tariq Hill does not get injured, if Jalen Waddell becomes more competent this year, then I believe that this team can be a force to be reckoned with in the AFC East, at the very least. I think they can make a playoff run, like I said, if they avoid that cold weather. But I think that, at the end of the day, realistically, when you look at this offense, you can't get past the fact that this looks like a 9-11 to 11 win team. Now let's look at 
a player who I've spoken about countless times for the Miami Dolphins in terms of whether he will show some even more progression or whether he will kind of regress. And so, Devon A. Chan's definitely going to be a player to really key in on if you're a fan of the Dolphins or whether you're a betting enthusiast or someone who plays fantasy and wants a good second option off the bench. Because Devon A. Chan, last year, really was kind of the whole chess piece of the McDaniel system. Because you had Mostert, who kind of has a very sneaky speed. He's better with his speed after contact, I would say, for Raheem Mostert. Devon A. Chan is a blend of power and speed, who's more workmanlike, but at the end of the day can really break out and get those big chunk runs that we saw from him last year. But this year, I don't necessarily think that will be the case, because in order to sustain this kind of offense, I do feel like Mike McDaniels will have to tweak the way he views the running game. Because the Von H. Chan is nice to have, but in all reality, at the end of the day, more teams will key into defending that run scheme than, say, trying to figure out a way to contain both Tariq Hill and Jalen Waddle. And so, if I'm Mike McDaniel, I'm thinking, I have to be a lot more patient with my rushers. And so I'm looking at A-Chan's over-under in terms of rush yards, and it sits at 775.5 total yards, much lower than what people would have expected coming into the season, based off of last season for A-Chan. And so... I do believe that A-Chan is not going to be a quote-unquote flash in the pan where he's just going to disappear from the public eye and he's not going to have any sort of playing time. No, he's still a useful piece. It's just that I believe that he will be utilized less and in more different situations. There's not going to be as much emphasis, I think, placed on trying to stick with the run game when it's going well. Because Mike McDaniel is always going to try and find variation. He's always going to try and find ways to adjust and ways to improve. And so I think that while a Chan certainly is someone to keep an eye on and pay attention to in terms of a lot of different things, I think that he's not necessarily going to be the same kind of quote-unquote emergency weapon he was last year that really got so many chunk runs that were able to catch people's eyes. In only 11 games, he did have over 7.84 yards per attempt, and so that also kind of speaks to what they did with him. It kind of speaks to how he really came onto the scene, and I don't think that's going to carry over. Let's talk about week one. The Dolphins play the Jags in week one, a southern game, in-state game. Um, but I think that this game really could be an intriguing one because in all reality, I could see this as a potential playoff matchup. Say the Dolphins somehow get the number one seed. I'm not saying it will happen, but let's just hypothetically put it out there. Would it be too ambitious to consider the Jags the seventh seed? Say that Houston wins the division, right? Houston fits in around the three or four seed. I think that the Jags potentially could slide into the seventh seed. If you think about it, the AFC North is going to beat each other up. So potentially only one team from there will advance. Maybe two. There's a place for some madness to happen, and if any division is more even than others and can actually get more teams to the postseason, I would say the AFC South. I would say that the Texans, the Colts, if Richardson is really who we think he is, and the Jags all have a conversation to be had to get into the playoffs. And so 
I think this could be a very interesting and telling game, both for the Dolphins and the Jacks. For the Dolphins, though, I'm taking the points with them. They're at minus 3.5. I think this game will just be about, you know, whether or not Mike McDaniels can truly employ many different ways. I want to see a lot of different looks as to what the Dolphins could be this year. Because last year, they kind of switched more to the running game, and it did help them in spurts. But when they focus on the passing game, I think that's where they can really shine. And so, it's the Jags and the team that's trying to stay in the conversation. If the Dolphins can set the tone against them, that will be a kind of precursor for things to come and potentially a warning shot to the entirety of the AFC that these are not the Dolphins who we thought they were going to be. This is a more balanced Dolphins team. And I think there's a lot more incentive to this. I think that that uh, the Dolphins organization is realizing that Tua and Tariq are in- integral to how the team will open up and expand their offense. So by tying them down, that really adds an incentive to start winning and start winning fast because they don't want to fall behind this crowded AFC pack. So I'm taking the points for the Dolphins. I'm taking the over in terms of wins. And A-Chan is going to be a mystery man this year. I think the Dolphins are going to be a very excitable team to bet on. And it's up to you. But coming up after this break, we're going to be talking about perhaps the worst team in the AFC. So I'm sorry, New England Patriots fans. It was a great ride when you had Brady. But we have to talk about them. I'll be right back to do so after this quick break. Looking for your daily fix of sports talk without having to pay for it? GSMC Sports Network is available on YouTube. Just search GSMC Sports Network. Get your fix of daily sports talk shows on YouTube absolutely free. NFL, college football, NBA, MLB, MMA, UFC, fantasy football, and so much more. GSMC Sports Network has shows running all day long with new sports shows starting every two hours. Just like on your favorite cable sports channel, except GSMC Sports Network is absolutely free. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the GSMC Fantasy Sports Podcast brought to you, as always, by the GSMC Sports Network. Um, We are going to be getting into our second profits of the day. It's kind of a sad one. It's kind of a glum period for this team right now after so much success in the Tom Brady era. How the mighty have fallen. They do have some intriguing pieces to them that I really want to see improve this year. But right now, this team is looking bad. It's the last team we're going to talk about in the AFC East. It is, of course, the New England Patriots. Now, I'm not saying the New England Patriots are in full-on rebuild mode. Let's be clear here. They have a lot of in-house options. And by drafting Drake May to compete with Jacoby Brissett, who should start the year at the very least, I think that the Patriots believe they're creating this product that will have results in the future. But at this current moment in time, I really don't see the concrete plan that the New England Patriots are implementing. I like Gerard Mayo as a guy's hire. I think he infuses a lot of energy into this team. I think he infuses a kind of youth that Bill Belichick didn't bring. I think that his kind of old mindset kind of muddied what the Patriots were, and he didn't necessarily improve Mac Jones. That's why New England find themselves where they are right now, but I think that Gerard Mayo could be the right person to get this team going. But, that being said, in his first season, I do not believe the New England Patriots will be any good. Let's look at their over-unders in terms of wins. They're sitting at 4.5, and and that might be a bit generous for them. It's... For the over, minus 165. For the under, plus 140. That could have been switched. I do not have much faith in this New England Patriots team. Like Jacoby Brissett is always a nice little journeyman quarterback, but at the end of the day, he should be hooked by at least week four. Um, and Drake May, I like the kid. He has 
fantastic traits. He has a lot of arm talent, but he has been pretty inconsistent. I do want to see him improve in terms of consistency and playing within the system. And I also want to see him work on ball placement, especially in the red zone. If the Patriots ever get to the red zone often. Um, but at the end of the day, this group is not necessarily that well-rounded, that balanced. I can't find anybody who can carry this group. But that being said... We're going to talk about Ramondre Stevenson in a little bit. He's a nice little piece. I see players on this roster that can break out, but most of them are on the defense. And on the offensive side of the ball, we've been waiting for so long for them to break out, like, hello, Kendrick Bourne. So I don't necessarily know when that will be. When will the time come when a New England Patriot really steps up on offense. Even in the Tom Brady era, Tom Brady elevated those wide receivers. And outside of Randy Moss, he didn't ever really have anyone who profiled as someone who you confidently said as soon as they got into the league, well, he's a wide receiver one. I believe that Julian Edelman became a wide receiver one because A, Tom Brady relied upon him, and B, by Tom Brady relying on him, he relied on himself to improve. And so... That's what Drake May is going to have to do. In the Drake May era, someone is going to have to rely upon Drake May to help him improve. And Drake May is going to have to elevate whoever is around him. around him. And so, I think that in order to set that emotion, it's all going to come down to how quickly Mayo is going to give Brissett the, cook, the hook. I think that it's going to come quickly. And it's going to come at a time where New England will want to see something out of Drake May. So by week four, that's my humble prediction for betting odds. It's a weird bet to put out there. But by week four, Brissett's gone. I think that Drake May, this will be his team for a majority of the season. And he's going to have to implement something, a mindset, a culture, pretty quickly. Let's talk about perhaps the best offensive weapon that the Patriots have at their disposal, and Ramondre Stevenson. I think he's going to be one of the more intriguing fantasy options in the league and one of the more intriguing real-life players in the NFL this season. Because Ramondre Stevenson, much like Devon Achan, but much unlike him as well, is that he is someone who profiles as more of a workhorse back, but he's someone who just wears you down as well because after contact... He drags you for another three to five yards. And so, when and if Drake May comes in this season, I think that Drake May is going to have to realize that, hey, Ramondre Stevenson's been here for so long, I should be following his example first before I truly become someone who is cocky enough to lead this group. And I look at the odds for Ramondre Stevenson. It says over four and a half rushing touchdowns. I think he hits that. Because there will be times when the New England Patriots find themselves close to the red zone. It's going to rely a lot on the defense and what they do. But there will be times, few times, but times where the no-brainer option is to hand the ball to Ramondre Stevenson from five to seven yards out. And so... A lot of people probably were thinking, well, if you're saying the Patriots aren't getting close to the red zone, why should I believe you that Ramondre Stevenson will hit the over? Because Ramondre Stevenson, like I said, just wears you down. And when he wears you down, eventually a 7-yard run could become a 30-yard run. You see what I'm getting at here? I think that Ramondre Stevenson sets up so well for this New England Patriots team because we know that there might be some ineptitudes in terms of the passing game. So I'm taking the confident over on Ramondre Stevenson in terms of rushing touchdowns. That being said, at plus 375 to have the worst record in the NFL, I have to take that. Because I think about other bad teams, say the Carolina Panthers. I talk about how they can't be worse than last year. I look at them, and they've made 
big additions to try and get Bryce Young to a point where he feels comfortable in the NFL. They drafted Xavier Leggett. They fixed their offensive line a little bit. They added Thielen last year. Let's see if he can help him in his second year as a Carolina Panther. They're doing things to really cement Bryce Young as someone who can be comfortable in the league and serviceable at that for the Carolina Panthers. I don't see the same thing happening with Drake May right now. I think that a lot of Patriots things are in-house and their own way. And I don't think that will work in the long run. They've got to start building around this kid if they want him to A, have any trust in this team, and B, build trust with the team he has. And so at this current moment in time, I can't see a path where New England's going to be competitive this year unless Drake May is this revelatory player. And so why not have the New England Patriots have the worst record in the NFL? I just can't see four or above wins for this team on their schedule. It's a very difficult schedule with a very thin roster. Let's talk about their week one game. To start off the season immediately, they play the Cincinnati Bengals. Now, this game could be interesting in that who knows what Joe Burrow will look like right out of the gate. Still kind of coming back from that wrist injury. But at the end of the day, the Bengals will just tear teams apart who they know are far inferior to them. They just have such a steady game plan, the Cincinnati Bengals, and the Pats don't. And who knows what Gerard Mayo will look like in terms of his scheme for this game because it's his first game as a head coach. And so I'm taking the under in terms of points here. It's at 43 the total. And I believe that at the end of the day, perhaps Brissett or May, if he's the week one starter, because I'm not necessarily leaving that out of the question, can keep up with Joe Burrow. He's such a calm and composed presence, whereas you don't have much calm in this offense. If you start Brissett, right? I think it's such a present. I think a lot of people in the Patriots camp, and I might be wrong about this, might want Drake May to start because they want to start building something quickly because they know they're in for a rough season. So they're like, they might be thinking that if May starts out right away, then perhaps they can get him to settle down and he can start building confidence in these players. But whether or not either one of them cannot keep up with Joe Burrow. That being said, I do think they're very even defensively. I like the battle of stellar kind of edge rushers and Judon and Hendrickson. I think that this could turn into an offensive slugfest should the Patriots look solid on defense. I think that Gerard Mayo, at the end of the day, is more of a defensive-minded coach, if anything. So he's not necessarily tossing and turning about them at night. And so, I think at the start of the season, maybe it will be a good thing if the Patriots lose, but it's a much lower scoring game than people think because the Bengals have the opportunity to make this look very ugly. But if the Patriots' defense can drag them into this game, then it could even out. And so, that's what I want to see out of the Patriots. Can they find a way, defensively, to bolster their offense? I think they need to win a lot of field position battles as well to truly try and win as many games as possible so that they don't have the ignominy of being the worst team in the NFL this season. But it certainly looks like that as we stand. But just, we'll just about do it for my prop bets for today's show. Coming next, we have our first kind of veteran in terms of college football player profiles on today's show. We're going to be talking about an undervalued star in the SEC when we come back after the break. For the best and latest podcasts available anywhere, go to the podcast app on your cell phone and type in GSMC. 
to access free content-rich podcasts on health and wellness, book reviews, sports, entertainment, relationships, social media, movies, technology, finance, and even weird news. Subscribe and download the GSMC Podcast Network's family of shows. Available everywhere podcast. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the GSMC Fantasy Sports Podcast. Hope you guys are enjoying the show. We are in the home stretch with our last two segments, and our last two segments will be two exciting, fascinating college football player profiles about two veterans, both with very different trajectories to how their careers have panned out. Let's start off with the one who has kind of been undervalued, played in the SEC throughout his entire career. When we think of SEC quarterbacks of recent years, we think about you know, Carson Beck, Stetson Bennett, Jalen Milrow, Bryce Young, all of these guys. But we always kind of forgot about this guy. And I do want to give him the due respect he deserves, give him his flowers in terms of fantasy option because he definitely is an intriguing one. Without further ado, let's jump right into the fantasy player profile of Mr. Jackson Dart. Like I said, we think about the SEC you think about the big guys. You think about the, the Alabama QBs. You think about the Georgia QBs. You might even think about right now Quinn Ewers coming into this. You might be thinking about Archer Manning in the future. But at the end of the day, Jackson Dart has always deserved to be in this conversation as one of the better elite college football QBs in the SEC. As soon as he came to Ole Miss, he really revolutionized Lane Kiffin's offense. Lane Kiffin wanted a guy like Jackson Dart. A lot of moxie, a lot of strength, a lot of determination at the quarterback position to really help get Ole Miss into the national conversation and the SEC conversation. And he's done that in spades. And this year, Ole Miss can surprise a lot of people. And I don't think that the SEC is as cut and dry as people think it is. Yes, Georgia and Texas are there. But after them, there are teams up and coming who might knock them off their perch. And Ole Miss has a good chance this year to do that. And it's all because of Jackson Dart. Now let's talk about all his departures. He loses a big one in his backfield in Quinshawn Judkins. But Jordan Waters is an after placement. And Jackson Dart is going to be proving a lot of people that he doesn't necessarily need Quinshawn Judkins in the backfield to look like a star. Without further ado, let's jump into the stats that make Jackson Dart so appealing and what you might have missed in terms of undervaluing him. 3,364 yards last year, 23 touchdowns, 5 interceptions for him. 9.4 yards per attempt. He's really flinging the football down the field, really catching the eyes of many people in terms of that regard. He will catch your eye if you didn't know his game beforehand. His best game was against LSU. That's a team that he's going to have to win against this year as well. 42.6 fantasy points, 26 for 39, 389 yards, 4 touchdowns, 50 rushing yards, and 1 touchdown as well. We do know that Jackson Dart does have that dual threat ability at the QB position. His worst, though, was against Georgia. Only 5.5 fantasy points, 10 for 17, 112 yards, 1 interception. And so, I do believe that Jackson Dart has a unique opportunity this year. Georgia comes to his house. And he doesn't necessarily have the most daunting SEC schedule. So, the reason why I think Jackson Dart can't be Unrestimated isn't necessarily because of that manageable schedule. It's because he's always been doing it. And he can't help it if the team doesn't perform around him against teams like Georgia and Alabama and now Texas. And so, you know, consider Jackson Dart. He's really gotten this Ole Miss squad ahead of schedule. And so, Keeping it on schedule just means that, hey, he knows he has the opportunity to do something even bigger than Ole Miss thought. They have the 12-team CFP. There's less um, you know, margin for error. There's you know, 
more opportunities for him to kind of slip up. But also, there's less Martin Ferrer because Salem Miss only loses that one game to Georgia. That means they're an SEC championship contender, and that means they're definitely a CFP. If they lose two games, they're also considered for the CFP. It's all about now just understanding that this opportunity is the opportunity for the Ole Miss Rebels to really get the respect they deserve, and Jackson Dart to finally get the respect he deserves. Let's talk about his receiving core, because this receiving core is one of the best in the nation. Juice Wells, a Juco transfer who formerly played for LSU. I think he's going to be an exciting, electrifying player. A deep threat for him. Then you bring back Trey Harris, who went 985 yards and 8 touchdowns. Second in the SEC last year. And Watkins, who had 741 yards and 3 touchdowns. And so, this is a very experienced wide receiver room. Now, when I think about what Ole Miss represents in college football... I think that this year's motto for them should be embrace the chaos, but not just within your own team. Because Ole Miss has always played in a lot of shootout games. That's where you might have learned of the legend of Jackson Dart. These iconic shootouts between teams like LSU, um, Alabama in the past. All these teams that were in that mid-tier and Ole Miss playing all these shootouts and Jackson Dart really shining. But this year is going to be different because the SEC is going to be a lot more like shootout style, in my humble opinion. You bring in two experienced Big 12 teams who are accustomed to playing in shootout games. And now you have this dynamic where these teams like Ole Miss, LSU, maybe even Kentucky this year, Missouri... I think that these teams are also going to try and take down the big dogs. Jackson Dart fits that profile so well because of his devil-may-care approach to the game. That's what I love about him. No matter what was happening at the time in the Ole Miss program, whether they were bad or whether they were getting their asses handed to them by, you know, Georgia's and Alabama's. All of that worry goes away. Now, Ole Miss can embrace the chaos they see around them and say, hey, we have a unique opportunity here. This is the first time there's a 12-team CFP. So we're just, hey, the third or fourth best SEC team, that's enough. And if I pull up this Ole Miss schedule here, I see this as perhaps the most manageable of quote-unquote SEC contenders here because, like I said, Georgia comes to their place, and I think they miss they miss Texas. They miss Texas. That's a huge thing. They play Georgia late in the season, November 9th. And they have a very manageable non-conference schedule as well. I say another big game, October 12th against LSU. That could be a shootout game. Oklahoma then the two weeks after that. And then that's smooth sailing from there. I don't see a team that really worries Ole Miss outside of Georgia on their schedule. And like I said, that game is at home for them. And so, when I think about what this means for Jackson Dart. And what this means for Ole Miss football. I think that in order for Jackson Dart to have a quote-unquote successful season, all he needs to do is just be himself but without Chudkins. It's kind of funny to say that because Quinson Jenkins was a huge part of what Ole Miss did last year because he really set the table for what Jackson Dart did. If Jackson Dart can be, hey, Quinton Jenkins may have been the star, but I deserve the respect that a lot of people may have not seen or recognized within me. 
he has the weapons to do it as well. Jackson Dart, first and foremost, also needs to realize that he's not alone. Because this was a whole team effort to get to this point. From where he started his Ole Miss career a couple years ago to where he is now, the chance to compete in the college football playoff is very special. So you need to realize that on every step of the way, these guys have played with him before. They understand him. They understand his system. Lane Kiffin trusts him. And the schedule is manageable. You can lose two games in the schedule. Let's say you lose to LSU and Georgia because those are perhaps the two games where it's kind of up in the air about who will win. You're still in primo position for a college football playoff berth. That's saying something from where this program was at the start of the Lane Kiffin era and the start of the Jackson Dart era for that matter to now. So just play the games the way you want to play them. Play with your style, Jackson Dart, and you, my friend, will be a SEC contender. If you don't, then I think this whole project and experiment will come collapsing down on them, and then you will have disappointed a lot of fantasy managers. But in terms of fantasy, I still think Jackson Dart is a little bit undervalued, so do please consider him. Now, just about do it for this segment. Our last segment of today's show, everyone's favorite college football journeyman with an incredible story to tell. We'll be right back to conclude the show with him after this quick break. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the last segment of today on the GSMC Fantasy Sports Podcast, and it should be a good one. Another college football player profile and another stellar athlete, another stellar veteran athlete. But this time, it's a different story and trajectory to tell than Jackson Darts. This young man was a journeyman for many years. He started off at the FCS level and Incarnate Word became one of their best players of all time, led them in passing yards. Transferred to Washington State, where he really made a name for himself as a Pac-12 player, and really got Washington State to a level that they didn't expect back into the national spotlight. Unfortunately, they did not follow their comrades to the Big Ten, and they sit in a weird position. And now their quarterback is one of the biggest national names in college sports. I'm, of course, talking about great Cam Ward. And we talk about college football athletes. And we talk about how the landscape of transferring and staying in college, most importantly, has changed. It's very interesting to see someone with Cam Ward's story still in college football. But I feel like in terms of real life and fantasy, we have to cherish a player like Cam Ward because with that experience breeds production unlike many others. In fact, I only believe that Dylan Gabriel has more passing yards in the span that both of them were in college than Cam Ward. 
And that's saying something about him. Now he goes to a Miami team that really believes that they can compete right now. This was a swing for the fences transfer. And if this doesn't work out, I feel like Miami will be set back many, many years in terms of where they are. They have what they believe is the receiving core to take them to the promised land. The ACC is a little bit chaotic. Florida State and Clemson might want to leave in a couple of years. So that might open up the ACC a little bit more. But this year is very pivotal because they believed in Cam Ward. And Cam Ward believed in them enough to forego the NFL draft. That's another big part of his story. Another big part of the story of what this means to Miami. A lot is at stake for this team. So let's talk about Cam Ward. Last season is last at the University of Washington State. 3,732 yards, 25 touchdowns, 7 interceptions. His best game was against Northern Colorado. Obviously, he's not going to be playing Northern Colorado every single week in the ACC. He's going to be playing some tough opposition. But he did have 20 for 26, 327 yards, 4 touchdowns, 0 interceptions. His worst, ironically, was against a guy we talked about before, Noah Fafita in Arizona. 5.1 points, 22 of 30 passing, 192 yards, and 1 INT. And so, the funny thing about Cam Ward is that when you talk about a player who started at the FCS level, and you talk about him progressing all the way to Miami, and now you're placing so much trust in him, it feels a little bit weird to truly call him someone who might be inexperienced in this setting because Miami's always going to be talked about in the national scene. And at Washington State even, no one was talking about them outside of perhaps the decision to try and stay in the Pac-12 and not uh, go to the Big Ten. And so, what this means for his career, for going to the NFL draft and going to Miami, is also very weird to consider as well. Because I think that Cam Ward would have looked more appealing in this year's draft as a late round pick than he will in next year's draft. Because last year's draft was a very top heavy class in terms of, you know, Caleb Williams and players of that nature. But there really was a huge fall-off after that, so I think picking up Cam Ward there. But it also gives us an opportunity to cherish Cam Ward's final college football season. And what we cherish about Cam Ward is that wherever he has gone, he has always been someone who not only elevates the team, but doesn't make it about himself. I think that's what Miami needed. And I think that's why they chose to, chose to go for Cam Ward as someone who can set the record straight and say, hey, we don't deserve to be in the national spotlight right now. We are actually awful. And we have an opportunity to now build and become something better. I think that Cam Ward takes Miami down a peg in terms of bragging rights. I think he offers them a sense of humility in terms of where they stand right now. But, like I said before him, he actually has the weapons around him to truly make Miami a threat, not just in the ACC, but potentially as a CFP contender. Xavier Estrepo, one of the better wide receiver ones last year and will be this year, over 1,000 yards and 6 TDs for him. That's not a terrible stat to have. Jacoby George. I really love him and his catch radius, his footwork, his tremendous ability to make contested catches. 864 yards. And Sam Brown, a Houston transfer, adds some electricity vertically as well. And what I love about Cam Ward is that he's going to respect that. He's going to respect that a lot of players on this team do have the profile of high-end players. They do have the profile of team of a team that deserves to be in the CFP. 
And he's going to work with that. And so, when I think of the landscape that Cam Ward has gone through, I think it'd be highly appreciative if Miami really coalesces around his message, really coalesces around him as a figure. Because at the end of the day, if you want to beat the duopoly of Florida State and Clemson, you have to represent the humility that they have. Because Florida State last year might have been the paramount example of a team with humility. They just, did, they just took everything in stride and heartbreak happened for them and they really kind of, you know, deserved better. And then with Clemson, when they were successful, yes, there was a lot of attention around guys like Trevor Lawrence, guys like Deshaun Watson, but Dabo Sweeney really tied that group together and made them realize, hey guys, we can't get in over our heads. Until we beat the best, we are not the best. And that's what I think Cam Ward represents for Miami because Miami just tried to do too much. They're always, you know, trying to get their boosters. They're always, you always hear these stories about Miami, Miami, Miami. But until they beat people, until they prove their point, they can be sticking around in this ACC for as long as Florida State and Clemson are here with them. Then Miami can be realized and they'll have bragging rights again. And Cam Ward in this process might just be a stepping stool. Because remember, this is what, like his fifth year playing the game of college football. So he's obviously going to go to the NFL after this. But in order for this season to really mean something to him in Miami, there has to be a cultural approach that borders on humility. The one caveat I have with Cam Ward going to Miami is his own success. Because I really like what he did for kind of the small school mentality. Coming from Incarnate Word, making his bones there, going to Washington State, not necessarily the highest profile Power 5 program. Having fantastic season after season there. Now transferring to a culture that doesn't necessarily speak to who he is. And so, if Cam Ward gets lost in that, I think he loses a lot of value. Not just as a fantasy player this season, but say he is a tie-in quarterback this season, but Miami fails to meet expectations, how that speaks to his draft status and how it speaks to future years when we talk about him as a fantasy football player in the NFL. I don't necessarily th- want to say that this decision ruined Cam Ward's reputation immediately, although that would be way too rash because I do, still do love him as a fantasy prospect and as a real-life player for Miami. But it does say something that Cam Ward wants to go to Miami in such a pivotal time. Because it could either mean that this is the back end of his college career and he just wants to enjoy his time, or this means he takes the job and role of Miami QB seriously. And I hope for Miami's sake that it's the latter because if it's the former, then you're going to be stuck in a cycle for years to come of trying to get out of this mindset of we're not the best anymore and we have to realize that before it's too late. And so that's the thing. There's a fine line between having fun in your final season of college football and actually competing. And Cam Ward has proven that the latter is always in play and will always be what matters to him. But it's Miami, man. 
you're going to be caught up in the allure of it at some point. When you play for Miami, you're caught up in that mindset. You're caught up in the expectations of it. And it's up to you to kind of realize that you're not bigger than anyone but yourself. And you have to play within that structure. You have to accept the fact that not everything's going to be coming up aces. And so I love Cam Ward and I love what he means for the season of college football. But he's got to be careful with how he does it. But that will just about do it for this show. Thank you guys for tuning in. I've been Chris Shepard on the GSMC Fantasy Sports Podcast. Remember to like, follow, and subscribe to the show. Leave a tip or donation at the link gsmc.cloud. Leave a super chat or super thanks in the comments on YouTube, and they will be answered and addressed in the next episode, as well as any questions, comments, or concerns left at gsmc.cloud. I will be back tomorrow for the last show of the week. Thank you guys yet again for tuning in.